Hello everyone, it's Sandra here and welcome to my first video on worm science. In this first of a series where I explore journal articles which are published research from the world's worm scientists, we are going to talk about what makes worms grow gigantic. And I think this has repercussions for both commercial worm farmers and for those of us who worm farm just for our own recycling and garden purposes. So I hope you'll stick with me as I go through this research, the methodology, I outline the fantastic results these scientists were able to achieve and how. And But I also look at the limitations of the research, which is maybe some things that were unclear, or they could have done better. And I tell you about a personal story of somebody who is achieving near the same results in her own worm farming, and I'll tell you how she did it. And then at the very end, I'm going to give you my takeaways from my perspective as a worm farmer, but also somebody who is skilled in research and research methodology. So the study we're looking at for our first foray into worm science is called Gigantism in Earthworms, a note on gigantic Icinia and Dendrobiana. So the Icinia, they're looking at the two Icinia species that we're familiar with as worm farmers, or most of us are, the Icinia fetida and the Icinia andri. Now, in the beginning, these two varieties of worms were synonymous. Um, most people didn't distinguish them from each other until a few decades ago. So there are species-specific differences in this research if you are interested in finding out which exact species you have, please uh, look into that and, and also talk to a worm breeder who would be more familiar with the different varieties. All right, and then the third variety of worm that these researchers looked at were the Dendrobiana, which are known colloquially as the European night, night crawlers. I'd just like to say something about the growth of worms. Worms exhibit something called indeterminate growth, which if you grow tomatoes, you know full well what that means. That means the organism or the plant can grow forever. It can grow throughout its lifespan. And so the limiting factors are gonna be food availability, competition, environmental conditions, which can also affect food availability, but there is no genetic limit on how large the worm can get. It can grow well beyond sexual maturity, unlike something like humans, that once our skeleton has reached its adult height, which happens shortly after sexual maturity in humans, uh, we can grow wider, unfortunately, but we can't keep growing taller. Whereas worms have no preset limit on how big they can get. So with that in mind, let's get into our study and see how these worm researchers grew some gigantic worms. All right, so just what can you tell right from this research right at the very beginning? Well, first of all, this is not a peer reviewed version. So that's a little bit of a red light. Uh, it means experts haven't uh, looked at it. But a positive, a green light, is that it's current research, and that means the researchers presumably have the benefit of you know, full analysis of everybody who's gone before them, which is something that research does, is it always collectively builds on the predecessors to come to more informed conclusions. And, and so that's why published research is a step above you know, uh, even a book, a book has no obligation to look at published research. It may simply be someone's collective opinions on a variety of topics, um, maybe built up from uh, decades of experience, which has value. Please don't ever think that I don't think experience has value, but a book is different from research. It can be based on research, but it's not necessarily so. And it's certainly miles ahead of somebody's a blog or article or YouTube video where they simply give them give you their opinion 
without uh, looking at it in a scientific way. Now, a lot of us worm farmers, we do look at the science and we do little experiments in our bins, myself included, where we look at different foods, we look at different beddings. So what these researchers did is not all that different from what you and I do as worm farmers. And I hope you'll see that as we go through that this is attainable. So how did these researchers do it? Well, they managed to achieve, now these are in what they reported, uh, worms that grew 20 times the average size. Now, the average there, I have to just uh, qualify, is based on their research of what the average size of these worms is. And so you, your results may differ, but uh, that is what their review of previous worm science showed them. Their results, 20 times the average, three times the previous record of the largest worms ever raised. The citation, this is always important with research so that you can look it up yourself if you so wish. There's the full citation. It gives you not only the print citation, but also the uh, URL that you could just um, copy that and uh, will take you exactly to this journal article. And the photographs that I'm using are used uh, from the study itself or from uh, Professor Dominguez's uh, personal, well, university website. And then a few graphics that I've, I've got from elsewhere. So first, let's look at their methodology. Well, what these worm scientists did is they took those three varieties of worms that I told about told you about, the two Icinia and the Dendrobiana, the, the Euros, and they put them each in a different little pan, about that size, about 1.7 liters, which is about two-fifths of a gallon, and they put five worms in each of those containers. And, you know, we're well familiar with that as worm farmers, five worms in that size of a container, that's loads of, wor loads of room for those five worms. And so nothing remarkable at this point. They put those containers, and I assume, although they didn't specify this, I assume they had multiple, multiple of those containers. They put those containers in what they call a growth chamber. They didn't precisely define what that growth chamber was, but I assume it meant it had temperature control, which they do outline the temperature and humidity control. They also state that it was in complete darkness. Now, the Icinia species were kept at 11 degrees Celsius, and the Europeans were kept at 20 degrees. Well, what I assume was 20 degrees. They called it room temperature. Again, they didn't put a number on it. So you can see where assumptions can stack one on top of one another in research, and clarity would have been helpful there. So it all comes down to what these researchers fed these worms. Now, they had three different foods that they reported on in this study. The first was spent coffee grounds. Nothing surprising there. Lots of us feed our worms spent coffee grounds. Remember though, that this food source was both bedding and food. So these worms were raised solely in spent coffee grounds. The second food source was sewage sludge. That's a lot of S's in that sentence. Sewage sludge is a product of wastewater treatment plants. Uh, it is used sometimes in fertilizing and other agricultural purposes so no uh, surprise there that this product, which is very readily available, there's lots of it, has now been uh, turned to by earthworm scientists uh, as a bedding slash food of interest. Worms readily get into sewage sludge. They really love it as a food. However, uh, when sewage sludge is fresh, uh, it's actually toxic to worms. It needs to be aerated and aged about two weeks before the worms can get into it, apparently. Uh, so presumably that's what these uh, scientists did. The third type of food that these worm scientists fed their worms was the contents of ox stomachs. So what you can imagine is that these scientists went to a slaughterhouse and they got lots of ox stomachs 
and then they excavated the contents of that stomach and they aerated the contents of that stomach for 35 days. Now that's an extraordinary amount of time. So let's just step aside and just focus on that momentarily to say, what would that do? Well, we know that the stomach will contain enzymes to break down food, gastric juices. There'll be microbes in there that will start breaking the food down as well. And that aeration will greatly increase the microbial population in those stomach um, contents. And I have to think somehow the digestive enzymes, those gastric juices that break food matter down, that must have a role to play too because wait until you see the results. So the researchers took that aerated ox stomach contents and they put that in those 1.7 liter containers as the bedding and the food. So just to recap, five worms in each container, all of five worms um, were all of one species and they had multiple containers containing the three different species. And they filled each container to the 90% level and they filled it with one of three food slash bedding sources, either the spent coffee grounds, the sewage sludge, or the ox stomach contents. So how these researchers ran this experiment was they took worms that had just reached adulthood. So they had just reached sexual maturity and those were the worms that they put into those containers. So all worms were approximately the same age going in. They gave the worms no additional food for the whole duration of the experiment. And other than taking the worms out periodically to weigh them, they didn't disturb them. Like I said, didn't add anything to these worm bins and the experiment concluded when the worms actually started to lose weight. So the researchers would take the worms out and they would weigh them. And when they noted that the worms were losing weight, they called an end to the experiment. That was as big as the worms were going to get. So the length of the experiment turned out to be 42 weeks long. All right. So here are some of their results. Now let's look at the European night crawlers first. So the European night crawlers on sewage sludge. Now I've given you two different columns here. You can see the weight per worm and you can see the worms per pound. So the weight per worm is, um, is shown there in grams. I don't think I'll give you the ounce uh, conversions for those because um, it would be very, very small. So the worms per pound is probably more illustrative of how you can do a, a fair comparison. So the weight per worm on sewage sludge was an average of 5.3 grams. And the worms per pound turns out to be 86 worms per pound. So those are, you could see that those worms are already pretty gigantic, right? If you could get 86 worms per pound, what a difference that would make to a worm farming business. Fed ox stomach contents, the weight per worm increased to 7.8 grams. And, and correspondingly, the number of worms needed for one pound dropped to only 58 worms. So again, just to recap, these are the European night crawlers being fed sewage sludge or ox stomach contents and showing that the ox stomach contents outperformed the sewage sludge, but both of them produced what I would call gigantic worms. So here's a sample from the study of what these worms look like. So it's a little hard to see the first measurement here, 4.2 grams, but you can see as the weeks went by, and this diagram represents four weeks, the growth of this worm from week one there to week four uh, was profound. So you're putting on about a gram a week 
until that worm topped out at 7.8 grams. Now let's look at the Icinia andri. Now, these worms, they also reported on spent coffee grounds as both a bedding and a food. And on the spent coffee grounds, the weight per worm was 0 0.34 grams. And that would mean that you would need 1,333 worms in order to get a pound. And that is actually more than uh, the typical weight per worm that's usually talked about. You know, usually people say that a thousand worms is one pound of worms, or I've even heard 800 worms is, a, is a, a pound of worms. Well, you can see if you only feed them spent coffee grounds, their weight actually is less than that. On sewage sludge, you can see a huge jump in weight going up to 2.51 grams um, per worm on average, giving you 182 worms per pound. Uh, which is a considerable improvement on the coffee grounds alone. And then they had an, one worm on the sewage sludge had a maximum weight of 3.46 grams, yielding 131 worms per pound. All right, now let's look at the ox stomach contents in the Icinia species. The fetida, the weight per worm, the average turned out to be 6 grams with 76 worms per pound. With the Icinia andri, it was 9.1 grams, the average weight per worm, yielding only 50 worms per pound on ox stomach contents. So there's a huge jump in the efficiency of this food to produce gigantic worms. If we just compare the three types of worms then, you can see that the fetida, let's just look at worms per pound, you would need 76 of those gigantic worms to make up a pound. The European night crawlers, you would need 58 of them. And the Icinia andri, only 50. So, you know, if you are looking to raise gigantic worms, in these researchers' study, they showed that the Icinia andri had the greatest potential to grow to gigantic sizes. So with limitations, we look at the criticisms in the research. And as I alluded to earlier, the biggest one has to do with the methodology and the huge gaps that these researchers left. The things that they didn't say or the things that they said that they themselves admit to as failings. Uh, the first one that they didn't say is they talked about feeding ox stomach contents to these worms. That was the premise or the research question that they put forward. However, when they were reporting results, they just kind of dropped in from nowhere the idea that spent coffee grounds were used as a bedding and food source and so was aerated sewage sludge. So you can see the confusion that that could create, not only in how much uh, you can interpret these findings, but also if you were to replicate these findings, which is the basis of all published research, is it must be able to be replicated. So by just mentioning these two other bedding and food sources without qualifying how they relate to the ox stomach, stomach contents part of the experiment, that's a big failing and I one that I hope the peer review process will clean up that these researchers will have to clarify. Are they building on previous results using spent coffee grounds and sewage sludge? And I think that's the case. However, they didn't say it. So without saying it, that's only an assumption I'm having to make. And so, you know, the the peer review will clean that up. But the, the other limitation that the researchers themselves alluded to was that the Brazil site failed to make regular weight measurements of the worms. So comparing the sizes of the worms, the growth rate of the worms immediately was off the table in terms of this study as soon as the Brazil site failed to meet up to that methodological requirement. And that's why this is an observational study. It's reported as, gee, look what we found, rather than this is precisely how to get worms to grow to giant sizes. This is exactly what we did. 
So it's a more casual study if you like. This type of research is a really good foundational piece that somebody can then take this and with a little bit of methodological clarification could build on it and replicate it in order to take it further. So now I want to tell you about somebody I know who's managed to raise at least one and probably now a growing herd of her own gigantic worms. Anne lives in Edmonton, Alberta, and she raises both Euros as well as the Icinia species. And she has them mostly indoors because Edmonton, it's difficult for worms to survive the winter, if not impossible. So she has them mostly indoors, but because she uses worm castings and she puts those in her outdoor plants, she found that some worms were living and thriving in some plant containers outdoors. Now, uh, she, when she brought those worms in at the end of the season, she wanted to save those worms from an ultimate demise with the impending cold weather. She noted some of these worms were much larger than her totally raised indoors European night crawlers. And so she set those aside in a special container and she's been continuing to feed them and monitor them. And she shared with me and gave uh, her permission for me to share with you her results. Now her largest worm is pictured here. It's a living European night crawler. Um, it weighs in at 5.03 grams, which means if Anne had 90 of those worms, they would make up a pound. So how did she do this? She is a home worm farmer. She does sell worms, but this is something that she does for her own gardening purposes for the most part. Now this worm had lived outdoors in a plant a container that contained living plants. And I do think that's a little bit of a clue there. The worm is now living indoors, but it is still gaining weight. Anne says that she is tracking its weight regularly um, and that she's now setting aside the cocoons that are coming from this worm. And she's uh, taken a very accurate measurement of the weight of those cocoons. And they are three times the weight of her other European nightcrawler cocoons. So, this actually speaks to something that the researchers alluded to in their paper, which was there is a genetic predisposition for some worms of the same species to have these gigantic potentials. Like I said, all worms can exhibit indeterminate growth, but about 20% of worms of any particular species have extra genes that allow them to grow even bigger. Now, Anne has at least one of these euros. In fact, I think she has more of them, but this is her biggest. And so she, by setting aside these worms and collecting their cocoons separately, presumably over the course of time, will have worms that will, you know, keep creating progeny that are larger and larger, or certainly as large as their parents, and so this will be a, a fascinating experiment to follow. And I'm just thrilled that I know her and I will be able to learn her results and hopefully she'll continue to share them, which she does, by the way, on Facebook through several worm groups. And so uh, hopefully you'll be able to spot her videos and photos uh, going forward. So how did Anne do it? Well, I asked her, I said, what conditions other than living in a plant container with a living plant, what did you feed these worms to get them to grow so big? She said the container um, had peat moss in it. It also had composted manure. Um, she fed it with some organic fertilizers because remember it was a plant container, but she said other than that, there was nothing um, remarkable. So I have to assume that, you know, there is that genetic pre predisposition to excessive growth or exceptional growth, if you like. And then the composted manure must have been really well aerated, I would assume. And that's how she got these uh, exceptional results. So my first takeaway has to do with the food and bedding source for these worms. 
obviously aeration was the key here that made the big difference. With aeration, these researchers were able to get gigantic growth. The aerated sewage sludge, the aerated stomach contents from the ox, the coffee grounds presumably were not aerated and served more as a control. So when we look at our own worm farming and whether we aerate uh, the foods, uh, generally, from my purposes, if I'm aging manure, which I feed to my worms, I just sit it in tubs or a pile and I let it age and, you know, I test it for herbicides and I test it to make sure that it's safe for the worms, but I don't aerate it. Now, if I did aerate it, presumably that would boost the microbes, something I've never considered. This research kind of hints that that might be something I could consider if I want to get bigger worms. And so uh, maybe, you know, if you're making worm tea, you know, are you going to then analyze it under a microscope? That has always been a recommendation that when you make worm tea, how do you know that you're getting a really, um, you know, uh, beneficial microbial mix unless you actually put it under a microscope and you look at it. Well, I can tell you another way that you know whether your worm tea is beneficial is you use it in your garden and you report the results. You And Jason and Colleen often do this. They'll feed one plant worm tea and the other one not, and they note the differences. And so, you know, if you have different forms of worm tea, one that you aerated for 12 hours, one that you aerated at a different temperature for 12 hours, or maybe you aerate at two different temperatures uh, for 24 hours, and then you test it on similar plants in similar conditions, you would be your own little experiment finding out which worm tea has the best microbial mix to achieve the best results. Without these sorts of controls, we're just sort of, you know, what is that, catching fish in a barrel? I'm terrible at cliches. But, but the idea is, is that by looking at the microbes, it clearly makes a difference to worm growth. And I think we could extrapolate it to making a difference to our plant growth because the worms, as you know, are just... Uh, uh, they accelerate or amplify, I guess is the better word, the microbial mix that they ingest. Worms just amplify it throughout the length of their body. So that's ultimately what the plants get through the worm castings or the worm tea. So another one of my takeaways has to do with the health of the worms. These worms did not exhibit normal physical characteristics nor normal worm reproduction. Um, as you can see from this picture, the, this is a picture of Icinia andri. It has a dilated body from the clitellum to the tail. That portion of the worm seems to have lost its normal red coloration. The only red coloration is now visible in the head of the worm. Uh, the two Icinia worms, the Icinia andri and the Icinia fetida, they stopped producing cocoons. Uh, so that is also an abnormal behavior of these worms, an abnormal reproduction behavior. And so if we contrast that with the euros, the euros went into hyper reproduction and produced numer numerous cocoons. And interestingly, those cocoons were viable, which means they all... Uh, produced uh, living um, wisps. And so I've heard that before. So my takeaway is, you know, when you put worms under stress, and I've actually heard a worm breeder say, if you stress worms a little bit, they'll go into a cocoon frenzy. Well, according to this research, that only works with the euros. And there's a fine line to, in my opinion, stressing worms to get a cocoon boost and and stressing the wrong worms and and leading to um, them getting uh, very uh, sick and perhaps dying. So so this is my takeaway here is that you know trying to go for these bigger worms might lead to dire consequences for the health of the worm. My next takeaway is a little bit of a caution, I guess, that I learned from this research, and that's 
that the guts of the worms were empty at the culmination of this experiment, which if you recall was at 42 weeks. So the we've always heard that worms will ingest their own castings sixfold over. And I've never heard a time frame put on that. Like that takes the worms a month, two months, six months, who knows? But when you think of it, five worms in a container with 1.7 liters of very rich bedding and food, you know, especially the sewage sludge and the ox stomach contents. So certainly that's quite a bit of food for only five worms. And yet at the end of the 42 weeks, the guts of the worms were empty. So that means that they stopped eating. Um, was the material toxic to them? Or was there some other reason why the worms, you know, that distension that we saw in the body? Is there some other reason why these worms were unable to ingest food? I don't know. The, again, the researchers didn't get into that. But I think it is a caution for those of us that uh, either just through our lives getting too busy and we leave worms in castings, or perhaps we set bedding aside, uh, or I'm sorry, castings aside, we have a bucket of castings and we're just using it in our garden and we're just using the stuff off the top, but some of the castings have been in there a long time and we all know that whenever you have castings, you're gonna have living worms in there. So do you have worms that have been living in castings a long time, in which case, maybe they similarly would suffer this result of having empty guts. And I presume that would ultimately lead to their demise. So a little bit of a caution for those of us who maybe have worms in castings for a long time, that it's not just a matter that they're eating their castings sixfold over, but there does seem to be a health consequence to the worms if they are left in castings for too long. So my fourth takeaway is why does size matter when it comes to composting worms? So if you look at, you know, composting worms and you're saying, okay, my goal is to go through organic matter quickly and produce castings for my garden. Will bigger worms do that faster? Uh, presumably a bigger worm is going to eat more. And so we'll crunch through material more quickly. And I think that is something that we will look at in future research. And so nevertheless, this study set out to answer that question about how to make the worms bigger. And they certainly achieved impressive, impressive results. But my takeaway here is whether you want gigantic worms really depends on who you are and whether you are selling or buying worms or simply raising worms for your own purposes. If you sell your worms, obviously the larger your worms, um, uh, the fewer worms are going to make up that pound of worms. So if you're red wigglers, you know, normally a thousand red wigglers will make up a pound, which equates to you know mixing it down to the metric system just under half a gram a worm this research makes a convincing case that if you can raise gigantic worms maybe not to the extreme case that they did of only 50 worms a pound but you're certainly going to have to supply fewer worms if you can get your worms to grow to these uh excessive or exceptional sizes now as a buyer, my takeaway is I would rather get younger worms and more of them. So younger, smaller worms and more of them. Uh, the younger worms would grow up in my home environment and produce numerous cocoons throughout their lifetime rather than waiting to get a larger worm from a breeder that has already spent, well, in this case, 42 weeks of its life growing big start young and I get the cocoons and I get to build up my herd faster. So starting with young worms and more of them seems like a good idea uh, from where I sit as a home worm farmer.
So remember that research doesn't duplicate real life and nor is it meant to. They must put those parameters on research to narrowly study something to answer their research question. And although there were methodological limitations with this study, they did set out to raise gigantic worms and they did succeed in raising gigantic worms. Um, replication of their study, if you could do it, does not assure you of similar results, especially since they had those methodological gaps. But it does inform us, like I said in my takeaways, that aerating food seems to build up the microbial mix to such a degree that it allows worms to achieve a more optimum or the full genetic potential of their size rather than what we might be normally used to feeding non-aerated food to our worms. Okay, so my hint for next time is that we're gonna be studying the growth of worms again, but also now their reproduction. And instead of ox stomachs contents and sewage sludge, we're going to be looking at common bedding types that you're probably already using with your worms. And I'm going to be showing you what the research says leads to the best growth in worms and the best bedding for the best reproduction in worms. And so hopefully my takeaways will once again be able to inform you when raising your own worms. So thank you so much for sticking with me through this first video in my worm science series, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.